Home Street Bank is the sponsor of our podcast. Go to homestreetbank.com to learn more about them. They're our lender of choice, whether your banking needs are personal or business. Great people, great rates, tremendous service. That's homestreetbank.com. Are you frustrated by trying to win the sale based on price alone? We might be able to help you with that. Stay tuned. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of The Buyer's Mind. I'm your host, Jeff Shore, where we take the opportunity to try and figure out exactly how your customer makes purchase decisions. And what do we want to do here? We want to understand the way that our buyers buy. If we understand the way that they want to buy, then we can reverse engineer our sales presentation to make it easy for them to do that. You know, I, I recently interviewed a top salesperson by the name of Molly Jacobs. And um, I'll tell you what, she's just fascinating because her product is boxes. She sells cardboard boxes to companies that need to ship things. If you want to talk about a commodity, it doesn't get any more commoditized than a cardboard box. So how do you get a sale when your product is virtually identical to your competitor's product? Is price your only option? And that's what we want to talk about on today's episode. Joined, as always, by our show producer, Paul Murphy. Murphy, let me ask you a question. Are you a price shopper? I mean, as a consumer, how important is it to you that you're getting the absolute lowest price? It's pretty important to get the lowest price, but... Uh, you know, I'm also kind of a brand name guy, so I like Coca-Cola. Um, so I'm going to look for where mm -hmm. Coca-Cola is the cheapest, but I'm not going to go get generic cola. Mm -hmm. So, so you want the the lowest price you can get, but on something that you really want? Because I think we've all been guilty of buying something because it was a low price, and then feeling like I don't know why I bought yeah, that. Yeah, well, I bought generic cola before thinking, now well, I'll save a few pennies. And then I was very sorry sure. I did later. Uh, and, and I might be just sort of an oddball on this, but I actually want to spend more money. <laughs> and let me explain what I mean by that. I want to have a reason to spend more on a product. Uh, listen, I love getting a good deal. I really do. But I love it even more when I get a great experience. And I'm willing to pay for that great experience. So, to give you an example, I was in a store recently, a hockey supply store called Pure Hockey. And I have to tell you, they took such good care of me that I didn't bother to comparison shop, to price shop. I didn't want to. I could have given them the old, well, I want to think about it, and then gone online to comparison shop and see if I could get the product cheaper. I could have done that, but I didn't. And you know why? I like these guys. I appreciated the experience. They were so helpful. I wanted to buy from them because now what do I have? I have not only the product, but I have that great memory, that great experience of actually being in the store. I wouldn't be talking about it right now, except that I feel good about that. And, and I think that this is where customers are at. You can go to an amusement park or you can go to Disney World. You can go to a nice restaurant, or you can go to the French Laundry. Now, listen, Disney World, French Laundry, and I could come up with a thousand examples like that. You're going to spend a lot more. Why? Because it's not just about a product. It's about an experience. It's about the way that you feel. And here's my question as it relates to whatever it is that you are selling. My question is this. Why you? What makes you? you stand out. What reason do you give for people to shop from you? Now, listen, please don't say quality, okay? Please don't say, well, my quality is better. That only works if your competitors are willing to say, well, that's true. We don't really put a lot of premium on quality here, right? Please don't say value. That's a buyer word, not a seller word. Everybody says they have great value. What I want to know is, what experience do you offer that separates you from everyone else? When you provide something unique, you decommoditize. So, so we don't provide sales training at Shore Consulting. We craft these unique experiences that are different than you're going to get from any other company. And that uniqueness keeps us out of the commodity trap. We have zero interest in being the cheapest option. 
I do. I would never, ever want to look at it and say we are cheaper than anyone else. Because in order for me to say that, I would also have to admit that my product offering, that our experience offering, isn't any better than anyone else's. And it's simply not true. So you have to ask yourself the question, what do you do that is truly unique? And today's guest is going to show us how to do just that. How do we achieve sales differentiation? Well, I'm thrilled now to be joined by Lee Sauls. I, I've uh, known Lee. We've been a, a part of the same group here for uh, quite some time. And several years ago, when he wrote Higher Right, Higher Profits, boy, I, I, I ate that book up. It was such, such a good and timely book that was really necessary. And now he's back again with Sales Differentiation, uh, which I think you're absolutely going to love. Uh, Lee is the CEO of Sales Architects. He is uh, an expert in the area of sales differentiation, and he works with senior executives and business owners across every industry so that we can figure out how to get more deals, how to stand apart from everybody else that's uh, that's out there. Uh, Lee is a widely respected uh, sales authority. He's a featured columnist in a number of business journals, and he's just a really, really good guy. Lee Sauls, welcome to The Buyer's Mind. Jeff, thanks so much for having me. Let's have a little fun here. Uh, so, you know, one of the things when I when I started to read the book here, uh, I was captivated right from the very beginning because our mutual friend Jeb Blount read the uh, uh, wrote the forward, and mm -hmm. the first words of the forwards, you guys are all the same, right? <laughs> so, so we hear this all the time. It's the it's the 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 it's gonna kill us one day as salespeople. It's like we hear people say, "You guys are all the same," and uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like this was a book that you, from the very beginning, said, "No, let's let's debunk that. Let's 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 find a way to to get out of the idea that you guys are all the same." Yeah, you know. It wasn't so much on the, the buyer side. I mean, we're all buyers, right? We all buy products, services, technology. And our fundamental goal when we're buying is to commoditize, meaning we want to put something in a grid, whether some people do it on paper, some do it in our heads, and we say, here's our criteria in the column. And across the headers, we, we have the places where we can get it. And our fundamental goal is to make everything seem like it's the same and get it for the cheapest price. So I was inspired to write this book, and this is this is a labor of love. I mean, I, gosh, this is something I've been passionate about since I was a teenager, working in various businesses and trying to figure out why would someone buy from you relative to the competition. And, and so over the last, gosh, 25 plus years, building this sales differentiation philosophy and helping buyers see that there are meaningful differences and that they're worth paying more for them. But this is already, uh, it's got my head spinning over here, Lee. When you're looking at it, saying it's the goal of the customer to commoditize, can, can you expand on that just a little bit? Because I, I never, I have to confess, I never really thought of that from the perspective of, when we're shopping, we are trying to commoditize. I always look at it from the other side, asking, how do I make sure I do, as a seller, that I do not get commoditized? But I'd never really looked at it from the position of a buyer trying to commoditize. Yeah. And, and I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I found in working with buyers over the years and even looking at myself, fundamentally, when we say we need to buy something, whether it be a car, a house, carpeting, whatever it might be, we try to organize information in a meaningful way. And we've been taught to think in terms of a matrix where you identify what your criteria are and the places you can get it. And no one wants to pay one penny more than they need to for the exact same thing. I and mean, why would you? That's the definition of insanity, right? Mm -hmm. Buying something, paying more money for it, but it's identically the same as something else. So this is uh, this is absolutely right. It, it, it's it's uh, it's it's resonating with me. I think it's going to resonate with our audience as well. And so from that perspective, with that platform, you came along with uh, sales differentiation. So so tell us uh, what sales differentiation. How did you come up with the title in the first place? And and give us the 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 big picture right here. Well, you know, when you work with a publisher, you don't take ownership of the title. <laughs> so I had shared with them what the philosophy is, what the book was all about. And they came back to me and they said, the title of your book is Sales Differentiation. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's no book that's ever been written on the topic. There's no book with that title. 
So that's going to be the title of your book. Yeah. And so the, the premise is that it doesn't matter what you're selling. There's always a conversation about price. And as we talked about, buyers are trying to justify the price that, that you've associated with whatever it is that you're selling. So that's when the game begins. So from a salesperson's perspective, can you demonstrate enough value in what you sell and how you sell to justify that price point that you've, that's been associated with that item? And quite frankly, a lot of salespeople struggle with that. Mm -hmm. And what do they do? Well, let me go ask my manager if I can take 10% off. And that's their strategy to win the deal. And from a, a company perspective, every single instance where you reduce your price unnecessarily, the result is you got the deal, but you've sacrificed margin dollars to do it. So the core objective that I have with this book and, and this philosophy is to help salespeople win more deals at the prices they want. Okay, so let's let's uh, look at an example here. Let's suppose that I'm selling uh, brand new cars. Okay, I've never sold cars before, but let's assume that I'm selling brand new cars. Okay. And uh, there's a dealership across town. It's it's not that far away. Now it's a new car, so the the, the make and the model and the specs they're they're all uh, dictated by the manufacturer over here. That car seller is going to be dealing with a customer who is absolutely looking to uh, commoditize the product. Or are at, they don't want to spend, as you said, a, a penny more than they have to. So I can hear a car seller out there saying, "I'm sorry, but if I don't offer the lowest price, I'm not going to get the deal." Well, and if you ask the ownership of that dealership, is that your strategy that you just want to win deals on price? I'm guessing they're going to say no. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And and so what you're seeing is a lot of dealerships looking at various ways to differentiate themselves beyond the vehicle. Because let's say you and I are both selling Fords. And they can get a Ford Expedition from you. They can get a Ford Expedition from me. So they try to differentiate the service experience as a way to get people to buy from them versus the alternative. You've also seen over the years some different strategies around no haggle. This is the price. I remember that was Saturn's approach. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. they, they had some challenges with their, with their business model. But you know, recognizing everyone loves to have a new car and they hate the process of buying the new car. I just went through this with my daughter. My daughter, she's a sophomore in college. She came home from school and she said, Dad, I want a car. I said, well, that's great. We're not getting another one. We already have three. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, I'm paying for it. I said, okay, talk to me. She said, well, I'm going to nanny. And, and so I want a car. I said, okay, that's fine. And we worked out the parameters for that. And then I went through and, and helped her with the exercise. First, I had her go into the dealership and I told her some questions to ask and, and go through that experience. And then like every, it's like every single time you go through this car buying experience, you get to the hassle phase. Uh, oh no, I never said that. Or, Oh, this wasn't really, this isn't included. And, and so where salespeople have an opportunity to differentiate themselves with, with car selling is make it pleasant for me. Make it an experience that I enjoy. And, and one of the, the core premises that in this book is that people don't know how to buy what you're selling. I've never had a salesperson in any industry, no matter what they're selling, tell me that the people that they're selling to know more about the world of potential solutions than they do. Not one, not in any industry, not in B2B, not in B2C, none. Salespeople have a greater expertise in those possible solutions than the people they sell to. So in my opinion, that provides them with both an obligation and an opportunity. My perspective that a salesperson's job is to help their buyer achieve whatever it is their objectives are, help them make an informed purchasing decision. The opportunity is for you to help shape decision criteria because they don't know what, what to ask. Mm -hmm. For example, when, when you're selling cars, of course, the salesperson never brings up the fee when you return a lease vehicle. That never comes up because that's counterproductive to the sale. Mm -hmm. 
But mm-hmm. if I was selling and I knew that my fee for returning there, either there wasn't one or it was lower than alternatives, my counsel would be make sure when when you're going through the process of selecting a a vehicle to lease that you ask about that fee when you bring the car back. So the opportunity that salespeople have in the car space is you can't change what you sell. The vehicle you can't add colors or features to the vehicle. It just is. But if you think about the experience that you create for people that are coming in to buy a car, think about all the emotions that they're feeling. Excited to get a car, a little nervous about the investment for a car. Uh, historically, we've all been taught that car salespeople are shady. I mean, if you're in car sales, you may not like hearing that, but that is the perception. If you think of uh, that old show, WKRP in Cincinnati, right? The the, uh, the car, Herb, the car sales guy, mm-hmm. I mean, they made him a very shady individual. So, People are coming in guarded when they're when they're coming in to buy a vehicle. So if you understand all of that, you have the ability to create a differentiated experience so that someone would prefer to do business with you rather than the competition. When you look at differentiating, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, a lot of salespeople are going to say that sounds more like a marketing thing than a sales thing. And and I, I would look at it and say, well, there's certainly no question that marketing has its its role in trying to differentiate. But uh, I, I think you and I are probably going to land on saying, nope, salesperson, you, you got to own this one. Well, it's not so much the, the salesperson. It's just in my perspective as part of this whole sales differentiation strategy is there's two types of differentiation. There's marketing differentiation and there's sales differentiation. And that doesn't mean the salespeople are the ones necessarily to innovate that sales differentiation strategy. It could be a collaborated approach with the management team or the company could say, this is how we're going to establish that. The the way I define the two and the distinction is marketing differentiation is one directional communication for the masses. That's what trade shows do, websites. It, It screams at the market, hey, look at us, we're here. And it paves the way for salespeople, right? So if you keep with this uh, car experience that you shared before, marketing differentiation, it's the commercials that's saying, hey, look at this new next year vehicle, whatever year it is. So the 2019 blah, blah, blah car, and it has these features and functions, and you should really get excited about it. So it creates intrigue. Sales differentiation is two-directional communication with an individual specific buyer. So if you think of it from the the car experience, it's marketing differentiation that'll bring someone to the showroom, but each person shows up with a different circumstance, a different reason why they're considering a vehicle. And it's the interaction between the salesperson and that specific buyer that leads to a particular car ending up in your driveway this afternoon. I remember my folks told me a couple of years ago, there was a vehicle, they were so excited about it. And the only thing that went wrong was the salesperson experience. They walked out and didn't even buy from that brand afterwards. If you look at it from that perspective, then the the separation between sales and marketing uh, from that salesperson, can we talk about just the sort of the the nice factor, the the likability factor. Uh, we know that likability has a huge, uh, you know, it's a huge part of influence and how we influence. How much do you look at this and say, hey, listen, if you want to differentiate, part of this is just going to be, what is it? What does it look like to being to, to you being your best self, and how much does that matter uh, to your customer? Well, I don't know if I would use the word nice but valued with one, someone that that's going to help me. And then another one that I talk about is being genuine. Mm -hmm. I had a salesperson that worked for me many years ago. And while she was working for me, she, she became pregnant and huge fortune 1000 companies bought her baby gifts when she had her baby. But here's the punchline. Those companies, many of them weren't doing a nickel of business with us yet. Huge companies, Mm -hmm. but she created so much value with them 
in her sales interactions. And she was so genuine in how she interacted with them that they felt a connection and felt, we'll say, an obligation, if you will, that when she had a baby to to buy her a baby gift. Mm-hmm. And so being genuine, it's I wish that's something you could teach. You either are or you're not. And when I say genuine, meaning that you truly care that the people that you're interacting with, that you're trying to sell, that you genuinely care that they achieve whatever it is they're trying to achieve. I built the sales team during the dot-com boom in the technology education space, and I share the story in the book. And one of the markets that we sold to were career changers, people in jobs other than technology that saw these great opportunities to increase their income, to have really strong careers in technology. And these training programs we were selling, they were they were intense. So the top salespeople I had, we called them education advisors, they worked very closely with their students and helped them get through the program. And I was fascinated. There was one item, one item that I could stack rank my salespeople on. One item, not revenue, not number of meetings, one item. And that was the use of tissues. Jeff, boxes of tissues. My top salespeople were so genuine, so caring, that when someone came in for that initial consultation, it was usually very emotional. These Mm -hmm. people were saying, hey, I I need to get a different career because I want to buy a home. I want to start a family. I'm in debt. Whatever it was, it was very emotional. The salespeople that were just trying to peddle a training course, Mm -hmm. the box of tissues that was in their office when they arrived was the same box that was there when they left. And that's what I mean about being genuine. I love it. You know, one of the things that we uh, that we see in the sales world that that, uh, you have addressed and I I love this. I want to ask you about it. Uh, it. It drives me crazy when salespeople ask ask the same questions the same way as every other salesperson, and then they were surprised that they got commoditized. Uh, I see it oftentimes working as I do so much in the the, uh, the B2C world when somebody says, what brought you out today? So I despise this question. I hate it because it just makes you sound right from the very beginning. It's like, let's get to it. And I'm like every other salesperson uh, out there. Uh, you do the same thing. And I, I thought this was really interesting. Um, in one of the chapters, you talk about two words uh, guaranteed to turn off the decision influencer. And those two words being, I want. Can, can you elaborate on that? Because I thought that, that that was really an interesting spin. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So those are two words that are deeply ingrained in our communication style. It's not limited to sales, mm-hmm. although salespeople are the ones who we're talking about here that that are the uh, the guilty parties, if you will. And so we've been taught as a best practice to set an agenda for a meeting. And it sounds like this. Well, what I want to do today, that's the way it starts, right? What I want to do today, mm-hmm. well, nobody cares what you want. That's not true, actually, Jeff, as you know from the book, there's one person in the world who cares what you want, and that's mom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no one else cares what you want. Of course you want, you want to get a commission. So what? if you really want to sound different and be different, put it in the context of their benefit and explain or position why. Why should I meet with you? Why should I tell you about my business? Why should I introduce you to my colleagues? Well, you know, I get these emails. I'm sure you get these too, Jeff from people saying, hey, I'm, I'm stuck. I wonder if you can help me. And one of the most common ones I get is, I've been working with this one person in an organization. I recognize that if I don't get introduced to others in the organization, I can't get this deal done. So what do I say to this person to get them to introduce me to these others, introduce them to colleagues? And they expect an answer. And what they get back is a question. Why should they do it? Why mm-hmm. should they introduce you to their colleagues? And if you can't answer what's in it for them to introduce you to their colleagues, you now know why you're stuck. And the approach of saying, hey, will you do me a favor and introduce me to, to these other people? That doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Everything has to be in the context of 
what's beneficial to them and why it's helpful to them. Let's. Uh, you mentioned uh, the idea of those introductions, because when we think about sales differentiation, we think about standing out. We typically go to the scenario where I am being pitted against another salesperson for my product, for my services. But you also address the idea of, uh, of decommoditizing, if you will, in the prospecting portion, right? Which which in many ways, at least to my way of thinking, is more difficult uh, to stand out because it requires you to get attention early on for the right reasons, not because you're screaming and yelling, because you're bringing value long before they're, they're even a, a client. Uh, talk a little bit about how the book approaches the idea of prospecting. Well, there, there's so much messaging out there and no salesperson hasn't been told that they need a prospect, right? We've all been told you have to prospect, you have to build a pipeline and it's tedious, it's work. And quite frankly, it's not a lot of fun to do it. Right. So I had this creative strategy that's both effective and adds some fun to the entire exercise of prospecting. And it's based on this. Imagine it's two in the morning and there's a pounding on your front door. It's the police. They wanna talk with you about a crime that's recently been committed. Now they don't randomly pick your home and you for a conversation. They followed a trail of evidence, put together a crime theory, and that's why they've reached out to you for a conversation right now. So can you, guess where we're going based on that? A sales <laughs> crime theory. Mm -hmm. And we're searching for the answer to this question. Why should they want to talk with you right now? Mm -hmm. Not why should we talk to them? Why should they want to talk with us right now? So based on what you sell, based on the different people that you're trying to engage, you look for evidence. So for example, uh, you might be looking for that they had an acquisition or they announced a new product or they have a new location or they got sued or maybe their competitor is doing something that they're not and it's something that you can help them with. The key is to look for evidence that answers the question of why should they want to talk with you right now before you pick up the phone. Because if you think of anyone you're selling to, it's not just your competitors that are calling this particular buyer. It's all these other things that they may be involved with buying. So you have a lot of competition when you're trying to get FaceTime and your fundamental goal is to sound different in that initial call so they take the meeting with you. And that sales crime theory approach sets you up to accomplish just that. That leads into just the, the last question here, and and uh, it has to deal with a personal value differentiation. When you're looking at how you differentiate from everybody else, uh, how much does that come down to just here I am as as a human being with my unique skill set and personality? Uh, uh, talk a little bit about personal value differentiation. Sure. So the company takes the steps to differentiate what you sell. Right? Most salespeople can't affect the product, service, and technology. They might be able to configure it, but they can't necessarily define it. Then there's the how you sell. In some companies, it's prescriptive, and they've laid out step-by-step step that side of it. But regardless of what you sell and how you sell, there's a piece that's incumbent upon you, and I refer to that as personal value differentiation. And that is so tremendously important. Every single salesperson has this opportunity to provide personal value differentiation. Some do it without thinking about it, but some really need to think about what their strategy is going to be. And, and the key is all else being equal, there's one irrefutable differentiator out there. And nobody can argue that it's a differentiator. And that's you, that when someone picks your company to buy from, you're part of the package. The question you need to ask is, what value do I bring to the equation so that someone would prefer to buy from me and my company rather than the competition? And one area is around expertise. When I'm buying, no matter what it is, remember we said before that the people that are on the sales side of the table know more about the world of potential solutions than, than we do on the buy side. 
And so there's an opportunity that you have. I'll give you an example. I found out I needed to have insulation blown into my attic. And I've never bought that before. Had no idea what questions to ask to make an informed decision. And I decided to let my fingers do the walking. And that expression used to be associated with the yellow pages. I use that to refer to Google. So I went into Google and I found three companies that handle insulation. The first two, they sent salespeople out and they went up, stuck their head around and, and said, okay, so uh, here's the price uh, to do it and here's when we could do it. The third one, I made the appointment and then I received an email and the email said something to this effect. Hey, we recognize you probably have never purchased insulation before. Here are five questions you want to make sure to ask so you can make an informed decision. That salesperson was also the only one to inform me that the utility company had a $500 rebate for having insulation blown into my attic. The other two didn't even mention it. So what that did was it showed me that they had an expertise and were trying to help me make an informed decision and I bought from them. Was their insulation any better than the other companies? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Was their price any better? No, it was all very similar. But they differentiated themselves in this particular salesperson in providing personal value and helping me. Yeah, love it, love it, love it. Uh, hey, Lee, before you go, I, I, we've just got a, a few questions. We always end our podcast this way. We're going to put you on the hot seat. Uh, rapid fire questions, rapid fire answers. You ready? I just took a drink of water. Now I'm ready. <laughs> Your very first job. <laughs> You'll laugh. I was a maitre d' in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> you are right. I am laughing. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, when you were 10, you thought you would be what? A pitcher on the New York Yankees. Ah, okay. Uh, the most beautiful place you've ever stood. And don't say Yankee Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good answer. Yeah. Most beautiful place I ever stood would have to be Maui on my honeymoon. Mm -hmm. uh, any book that that you read uh, that made a profound impact on your life? Probably Seven Habits of mm -hmm. Highly Effective People. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a movie you've seen multiple times, but you would gladly watch it again if it came on television today. Caddyshack. Uh huh. And uh, your first celebrity crush. Whew. Christy Brinkley. Okay. I can't argue there. Uh, Lee Saul's uh, 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 just fantastic. Lee's book, Sales Differentiation, uh, it's out now. You can find it in, on uh, Amazon uh, in, in various forms, hardcover, Kindle, uh, audiobook. Uh, in addition to that, Lee offers consulting and workshops and keynote speeches on the subject of sales differentiation. And we're going to help your salespeople to win more deals. You can contact him through his website, salesarchitects.com, salesarchitects.com. We'll put that and his phone number in the show notes. Uh, Lee Sauls, thanks so much for being on The Buyer's Mind. Jeff, it was a blast. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it was really, really interesting, Murph, when uh, Lee Sauls was talking about the idea that it's the goal of the customer to commoditize, that when we say we need to buy something, we try to organize information in a meaningful way. We identify the criteria where we're going to find the product, and then we ask, how can we pay the lowest amount possible? That commoditization is really easy. That's a, I never really thought about trying to commoditize as a consumer, but that made sense to me. What about you? It did make sense. I, I guess I'd never thought of it that way, just like you hadn't. Uh, but it was that idea of, I am. I'm always looking for the lowest price. Mm -hmm. And that ends up making whatever I'm buying a commodity. Yeah. Right. Even if I'm going to overlook uh, the experience in order to do that, which is always a dangerous thing uh, to do. I also love the idea of that curse of the I want, you know, as a salesperson saying, I want to do this. I want to show you this. I want, I want. Uh, you know, rather uh, to take what Lee Sauls had to say, why should they want to talk to you in the first place? What would be so intriguing that would make them warm up to the idea of talking to you? I think we got to get away from the what we want in the sales presentation and really look at it and said, is why would the customer want to talk to me? That's kind of a different spin, don't you think? I do. Uh, the other thing that I liked from him was that most people don't know how to buy what you're selling. Mm -hmm. So if they're if you're a counselor to your buyer, informing them about you know maybe the gotchas, 
and, and why you're better, that that's going to differentiate you. It really, really does. And I, I think if, if you know, this is why one of the most effective closing techniques that I have ever used and that I've talked to many, many salespeople is the idea of the explain the process close about going through and saying, hey, listen, should you decide to purchase? Let me explain the process. And then what do we do? In less than 60 seconds, we give them a top level overview of the purchase process. But I do that by starting with step number one. So I'm going to say, should you decide to buy? Let me explain the process. The first thing we would do is sit down and write a purchase agreement, and then we would do this, and then we would whatever it is. But then when I've explained the process, now I'm going to go, and that's the way the process works. Now, the very next step in the process is to sit down and write a purchase agreement. Is that where you're at? Is that what you wanted to do? And the question is very conversational. It's not in your face. It's not manipulative. It's like the next step is to sign a purchase agreement. Is that what you want to do? That's it. There are only two possible answers to that question. Yes, great, congratulations, you're going to love it. Or no, okay, well, worry out. What are you thinking about? So, so the idea here is that when we make it easy for a customer to buy, we relieve their cognitive strain, right? It's just that we get rid of that brain strain and, and they understand it. And, and now that just uh, frees it up. We, we let them know this is the path. Is it the path that you want to go on? I'll tell you, just as I listen to Lee Sauls and I listen to how I stand out, I want to make a suggestion here to you. I want you to spend some time journaling. I, I think I, I would encourage you to sit down somewhere in a quiet place, you know, maybe a Starbucks or, or, or you know, first thing in the morning before the, the house gets hectic and just ask yourself the question, why should someone select you over all others? What do you bring that is unique. If you want to get away from that commodity trap, you have to figure out how to differentiate. So if you sit down and you start listing it out, what do I bring? What? Why would someone select me over all others? And then as, you, as you're doing that, ask yourself the question, is this my concept or is this the customer's concept? In other words, is this something that I am currently doing or is this something that I should be doing, that the customer would like to see me doing that, that, that I am not doing now? But it takes that time of self-reflection. So I want you to journal it and then I want to recommend that you have the conversation with someone else with one of your peers, with somebody who understands sales, with your boss, with a coach. But try and ask yourself the question, is this differentiated enough to get out of the commodity trap? How can I stand apart from every other salesperson when I do that? That's when I really make that unique statement. That's when they want to do business with me. And that is when I have the opportunity to change their world. Hey, I wanted to just encourage you, if you haven't done it yet, make sure that if you're on uh, iTunes that you have uh, rated the program and that you've written a comment. That really helps us to get the word out even more. It increases our visibility, and we want to continue to spread the podcast. So if you're finding value in the podcast, make sure you take the time to give us a rating and maybe a quick shout out in the, in the review sections on iTunes. We sure would appreciate it. And we'll talk to you next time on The Buyer's Mind. 